Welcome to 13 Cubed. In this episode, we're going to revisit NTFS index attributes, often referred to as $i30 attributes. If you haven't yet watched the previous episode covering this topic, I'll forgive you. It's a few years old. In it, we used Willy Ballanthan's INDX Parse, which is actually a suite of tools used for inspecting NTFS artifacts. Specifically, we used indxparse.py to break apart an i30 file we exported via FTK Imager. This time, we're going to start with a quick refresher of this important NTFS artifact, and then we'll take a look at another tool that can help us parse these indexes. The tool, INDX Ripper, is specifically designed for integration into file system timelines, such as those you might create with Eric Zimmerman's MFTE CMD or the Sleuth Kits FLS. If you're wanting to parse a single i30 from a single directory, you're still probably better off using indxparse.py, but if you want to quickly scour an entire file system and extract all of those i30 attributes, INDX Ripper may be the better choice. Bottom line, use the right tool for the job and never put all of your faith in any single tool. Trust, but verify. All right, so what exactly is i30? Well, in short, it's the Windows NTFS index attribute. It's how the NTFS file system keeps track of which files are in which directories. More specifically, it's a B-tree index of files within a given directory. When the B-tree index is rebalanced, which will naturally occur as files are created, deleted, and moved into and out of a directory, it can result in slack space that can hold remnants of previously existing i30 records. Now, directories with a small number of files will store these attributes within a structure called dollar index underscore root. These are always resident in the MFT. Directories with a larger number of files will store these attributes within a structure called dollar index underscore allocation. These are always non-resident. So the index root, the index allocation, and another attribute called dollar bitmap, which tracks which index records are in use, are together referred to as $i30. So it's more of a virtual construct. All right, so with all that out of the way, what exactly can we find if we crack open one of these i30 files and parse it? Well, we can find the following. Obviously, the file name, the parent directory in which the file exists or existed, the file size, and a set of timestamps, the MACB timestamps, specifically modification, access, MFT record change, and birth or creation. Now, the entries utilize the timestamps stored within the $file underscore name attribute, not $standard underscore information. While updates to file name attributes can differ from standard information, in most cases, you can expect the set of timestamps stored here to be the same as those in standard information for a given file. But just remember, they are timestamps from the dollar file underscore name or dollar fn as we sometimes refer to it not standard information the cool thing though is that even if a file has been deleted or even securely wiped the i30 index record for that file may still be hanging around in that slack space meaning that we could potentially derive all of that metadata that i just listed for a given file even if the file itself has been long deleted that's the value of this artifact all right, with all of that out of the way, let's switch over to the demo and take a look at INDX Ripper in action. As you can see, we're starting off our demo in FTK Imager. So let's go over to the file menu and choose add evidence item. For the source, we're going to select image file and then click next. We'll click browse and then point to the file we're going to be using for the demo, which is conveniently called testimage.raw. You can see it right here next to the VMDK. I'll double click on that to select it and then click finish. Over on the evidence tree, let's expand all of this and go into the root of the image. And in the root, you can see there is an 11.docx zero byte test file and then a bunch of NTFS metadata, including the $i30 for the root directory. Let's go into the documents directory here and we should again see a $i30 for this directory and a few more docx zero byte files for testing purposes. But check this out, secret.txt, hmm, it's got a red X next to it and it says $i30 index entry. Well, that is an index entry hanging out in Slack space of this i30. And if we scroll down far enough, we should see reference to it. And there it is right there. 
So that's going to give you a clue as to what we might be able to pull out of this when INDX Ripper runs. But we need something to use for comparison, so let's go back to the root directory, right click on the MFT, and export a copy of the MFT. We'll save it to the desktop. That way we can parse the MFT and compare that output with the output of INDX Ripper. All right, so let's change into the desktop and we'll run the attrib command because as you can see, the system and hidden attributes are attached to the $MFT when we exported it, which is expected. We'll go ahead and remove those. That's not entirely necessary, but that way it'll show up in Windows Explorer and on the desktop without having to view hidden and system files. And so now at this point, we're ready to parse it. And to do so, we're going to be using Eric Zimmerman's MFTE CMD, which is located in my tools Zimmerman directory. So I'll change into it and we'll just run MFTE CMD with a dash F. We'll point to the path of that file, which is users, Davis RG, desktop, dollar MFT. For the dash dash CSV, that will be the directory into which we would like the results saved. We'll just select users, Davis RG, desktop. And for the file name, CSVF, we'll just call it MFT.CSV. And that's it. It should only take a second. And in fact, it took a lot less than a second. As you can see, it's already done. All right, so now what? Well, now we're going to run our new INDX Ripper tool. To do that, we'll change into that directory, which is just called INDX Ripper, and I'll run it without any options so you can see the available options. But basically all we're going to do is specify an image and then an output file, and that's pretty much it. So I'll repeat the last command here and we'll just specify the image source, which is on D, DFIR, images, and then it's that test image.raw that we mounted or added as an evidence item in FTK Imager. And then for the output, I'll just call it INDX.CSV and save it to the desktop. And that's pretty much it. This again should only take a second because this is a tiny image just for testing purposes. It's already done, as you can see, because it returned a blank line with no errors. And if we go into the desktop and take a look at the files here, we should see both of the CSV files. And there we go, indx.csv and mft.csv. All right, so in the next section, let's pop these open with Timeline Explorer and quickly compare the results. As you can see, both files are now opened in Timeline Explorer and we're currently looking at mft.csv. And this is all of the output. There's only 44 lines. Near the bottom, you can see those test docx files that we previously looked at in FTK Imager. Let's go ahead and hide all of the NTFS metadata files in the top right where the search blink exists. All we have to do to hide those is just do a minus dollar and press enter, and that should filter them out. And now we're left with just the files on disk, and nowhere here do I see any reference to secret.txt. Nothing here. Interesting. Of course, that's expected because it's no longer on disk. It's not in the MFT and it's not on disk. So now let's compare it with the output of INDX Ripper. Again, we have the ability to filter out the MFT metadata files, and now we're left with just the files. We can see all of those test docx's in the documents directory and one in the root. But let's look at the columns. Source, path, flags, file number, We've got a sequence number, a size and an allocated size. And then here are our Mac B timestamps, B, M, A, and finally C in this last column. And again, these are from dollar file underscore name, dollar FN. At the very bottom though, you see an index slack source. Let's filter just on the source of index slack. And as you can see, there is one match and it's for our documents secret.txt and we can see the size, the allocated size, and the full set of the $FN MACB timestamps. This is extremely powerful. This file is long gone, no longer exists on disk. Doesn't matter if it was deleted or even securely wiped with something like sdelete. The fact that we can see this means that we can prove that this file once existed in that location. We know its original size and we have that full set of timestamps we can reference. That is extremely powerful. And this has come in handy multiple times in real life, in real world investigations. So the ability to parse these $I30 files, in my opinion, is critical. So what about INDX Ripper? Well, think of it as just another tool to put in your tool belt when it comes to parsing $I30s. Now, again, if you're going after onesie twosies, you can certainly continue to use INDX parse.py as we discussed in the first part of this episode. 
But if you're interested in creating timelines and you want to very quickly and efficiently scour an entire image and then build a timeline of $i30 entries that you can roll into a larger timeline, this is the tool for you. I hope you enjoyed this quick look at INDX Ripper. And as always, thank you for watching. Thank you for subscribing, and I'll catch you in the next 13 Cubed episode.